today we're going to be doing a deep dive into Laplace transforms. What are they? Why do we care? And how do we use them? Now, this is actually a re-upload of a video I did a couple of days back because I felt like things weren't quite explained as well as they could be and I could structure things a bit better. So here we are. Now, the structure for today's video is going to look something like this. And I have left little timestamps in the description below for your convenience. So feel free at any time to just pause and jump around them as you wish. Now, before we begin, there are a couple of things that I need to get out of the way. The first one is this video is geared a little bit towards engineers rather than mathematicians. So what I mean by that is I'm going to be looking at this from a very practical point of view. You know, how do you use these Laplace transforms? And I'm not going to be diving too deep into all the formulas and any proofs. Now, second of all, Everything I'm saying only applies to linear time invariant systems or LTI systems. And if you have no idea what this means, please pause the video and Google it because this is quite important. But I don't quite have time to explain what LTI systems are in this particular video. Great, so let's get started with a very brief history lesson on where these Laplace transforms actually come from. And this is quite important in order for you to understand, you know, why do we actually use these things? So in 1744, Leonard Euler developed this transformation in order to help him solve differential equations. But to be honest, he did not pursue this matter very far. Instead, he went on to do cool things like figure out how beams buckle and things vibrate. But then Laplace came along 40 years later and developed Euler's ideas a bit further until he came with this equation, which is what we call the Laplace transform today. And I want you to go into the rest of this video with that little history lesson in the back of your mind so that you have a very brief idea of why these transforms were developed. I mean, they were initially a tool to help solve differential equations. So now then, why do we actually define Laplace transforms this way? And what I mean by that is, why do we use zero and infinity as the limits for the integral? Now, the reason for that is we typically deal in engineering situations with what we call causal systems. And causal systems basically just mean that if you have an input, the output will happen as a result of the input. You know, there's a cause and effect sort of scenario happening here. Non-causal systems would be a scenario where your system starts responding even before the input has happened, and those don't really make physical sense, so we're not going to be talking about them here. There is actually a Laplace transform that is defined for non-causal systems, and that's called the bilateral Laplace transform, where the limits go from minus infinity to plus infinity. So what then makes the Laplace transform useful to us? Well, I'm going to be talking about three main properties of the Laplace transform that make it so amazing. Well, the first one I've already touched upon, and this is how it acts on differential equations. It turns differential equations like this into algebraic expressions like this. And that is excellent for us because it's much easier to solve an algebraic equation than it is to solve a differential equation. The second very useful property of Laplace transforms is that they turn convolutions into multiplications. And I'm going to be going into an example of how this is useful a little bit later, so stay tuned for that. But for now, you just think that they turn this horrible, ugly convolution integral into a very nice, easy to work with multiplication. The third very useful property for us is that Laplace transforms are unique. And what that means is that there exists only one Laplace transform for every function. And this is so useful because it means that solving a problem in the transformed S space is the same as solving the original problem in the time space. And of course, there exists an inverse Laplace transform that can take you back from the transformed space to the original space. Now, here is where I like to bring in a little analogy to explain why this is so useful to us. Now, say you have a PDF and you have to edit it. Well, this can be a bit tricky in the PDF format. So what you might do is you might then convert it into a Word document, do your edits, and then convert it back into a PDF. And this is the same process you'd use for Laplace transforms. So if you had an expression in the time domain that's a bit difficult to solve, an equation, then you might Laplace transform it into the S domain, solve it, and then inverse Laplace transform it back into the original time domain. So now then, how do we actually go about using Laplace transforms? Well, first of all, you rarely actually have to solve the Laplace transform integral. Instead, you'd often refer to what we call Laplace transform tables, which gives you transforms of very standard functions, you know, things like sines, cosines, exponentials. So you'd refer to these tables in order to find out what the Laplace transform of your function is. But of course, if that doesn't exist in the table, then you would have to solve the integral. It's just that typically you don't need to. So here's the example I promised I'd give you earlier. So let's say we have some system and that system has an impulse response G of T. Now let's say we apply some filter to the system, which is gonna have an impulse response of f of t. Now our input is u and our output is y. Again, u of t and y of t. Now the question is, what is our y of t for some given u of t? And if you've watched my video on the impulse response, well, you should know that this is actually just the convolution of g and f and u. But here's the thing, 
This is not very easy to solve in the time domain because convolution can be quite a pain to work with. So let's transform this using the Laplace transform and see how easy this is to work with in the S domain. So taking Laplace transforms of everything, we have y of s, and I'm going to be using capital letters to describe the transform functions. We have y of s is just the product of g and f and u of s. So this is way easier to work with in the transformed space because it's just multiplication. Now, of course, if you want to represent this back in the time domain, we want to find y of t. Well, we just take the inverse Laplace transform. So here's an example with some numbers put in to actually make this clear how we might do this in practice. So let's say you work all this out and you find out that the product of g and f and u in the s domain looks something like this. It's this expression right here. Now, the thing is, you're not going to find this in the Laplace transform table. So what you might do is you'd use partial fraction decomposition in order to break this up into a sum of standard Laplace transforms and then use the inverse Laplace transform to go backwards and finally find out the answer in the time domain. All right, so now that we know what the Laplace transform is, why it's so useful to us and how we actually use it, let's cover the difference between this and the other commonly used transform, the Fourier transform. Now, the Fourier transform essentially gives you the frequency response of a system. So it's a bit like this. Let's say you take the Laplace transform of a system and then you sweep the input over a range of frequencies from omega equals zero hertz all the way to omega equals a billion or infinity hertz. The resulting output as you've swept the input across this range of frequencies is what the Fourier transform gives you. So mathematically, what this looks like is that you take the Laplace transform of the system, but you restrict S to lie within the imaginary axis. So S equals J or I times omega. So I have one more analogy for you to explain again why Laplace transforms are so useful. And this is exactly like the PDF analogy I gave earlier, but if that one didn't stick, well then hopefully this one will. So let's say you have a poem that it's written in English, but you have no idea how to analyze it. But your friend, who speaks only French, is excellent at analyzing poetry. So what you would do is you would take the poem, translate it perfectly into French, he would analyze it, find the meaning and solve it, and then translate it back to English to give you the answer. And that's essentially what we're doing with Laplace transforms and inverse Laplace transforms. So as always guys, if you have any thoughts or questions, then please do leave it down in the comments section below. And if you do like this kind of content, then do subscribe if you haven't done so already. And I'll catch you guys next time.